morning, congregation, and welcome to worship. This morning is a call to worship. I read to you from Psalm 66. Shout for joy to God, all the earth. Sing to the glory of his name. Give to him glorious praise. Say to God, how awesome are your deeds. So great is your power that your enemies come cringing to you. All the earth worships you and sings praises to you. They sing praises to your name. Let us pray together. Thank you for your amazing power and work in our lives. Thank you for your goodness and for your blessings over us. Thank you that you are able to bring hope through even the toughest of times, strengthening us for your purposes. Thank you for your great love and your unending care. Thank you for your mercy and your grace. Thank you that you are always with us and will never leave us. Thank you, Lord, for your incredible sacrifice so that we might have freedom and life. Forgive us for when we don't thank you enough for who we are, for all that you do, for all that you've given. Help us to set our eyes and our hearts on you afresh. Renew our spirits, fill us with your peace and joy. We love you and we need you, Lord, this day and every day. We give you praise and thanks for you alone are worthy. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This morning I'm going to read to you from Acts chapter 9, reading from verses 1 to 8, and then from verses 17 to 22. Hear the word of God. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by hand into Damascus. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it, placing his hands on Saul. He said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he could see again. He got up and was baptized. And after taking some food, he regained his strength. Saul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus. At once he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. All those who heard him were astonished and asked, Isn't this the man who raised havoc in Jerusalem among those who call on his name? And hasn't he come here to take them as prisoners to the chief priests? Yet Saul grew more and more powerful and baffled the Jews living in Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Messiah. The second reading is from 2 Timothy chapter 4, reading from verses 5 to 8. But you keep your head in all situations, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, discharge all the duties of your ministry. For I am already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time for my departure is near. I fought the good fight, I finished the race, I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, or award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. May the Lord add his blessing to his word this morning, and may his name be praised. When this year 2020 started, we all had dreams, we all had goals, and we all had plans. We had holidays planned. We had work projects on the horizon. We had set financial goals and so on. And then we were all thrown a curved ball and just when we thought the national state of disaster would end this week, Thursday, the 15th of October, we were told it's now extended to the 15th of November. Another curveball. We've not really understood fully the journey that we've been on this year, but all we really have been able to do so far is to trust the journey and to learn from it. None of us with hindsight would have thought that this year would teach us so much. None of us enrolled for the, the course Global Pandemic COVID-19 101. What are we becoming as people as a result of this pandemic? What have we learned through this global pandemic? 
I began to touch on some of these lessons last week and want to continue as we reflect in our series, What Next? So we begin this morning by saying that nothing in life is for sure. In saying that, there are some things that are for sure. And one of those things is this fact that life is hard, but God is good. Life is hard because we are living on a broken and sinful planet. God is good. That is what we need to build our lives on. This truth is what we all really need to put our roots into because that will allow us to survive all the way until the end of our earthly journey. We don't have to be convinced that life is hard. We all have enough life experience to know that. But the Holy Spirit wants to reinforce in you today that God is good. Remember those years in church when it was very popular to say, God is good. And the other people responded by saying all the time. And then the leader would say all the time. And the congregation would respond by saying, God is good. We need to understand those two truths. They are guarantees in life. Let me remind you again what they are. Life is hard, but God is good. At some stage, we have asked, am I going to make it through these days? And now we begin to ask ourselves, well, what are these days going to make of me? Do you believe that in the hardship, God has been work working gloriously? Do you believe that in the hardship, God is still good? As we read through the Bible, we soon discover that every story is a story of endurance. Every story reflects how hard life can be. We will reflect today briefly on Paul's life. And his life was a life of endurance, of challenge, for Paul life was hard. But he knew with all his heart that God is good. In Timothy, 2 Timothy 4, we read about the end of Paul's life. It's probably the last letter that Paul wrote. And he's writing to his son in the faith, a young man that Paul believed in by the name of Timothy. He's writing Paul one more time from a Roman prison. And he's writing to encourage Timothy to live his life, knowing that it will be hard, but God is good. At the end of chapter 3, Paul tells Timothy not ever to let go of the scriptures. He says these words, You have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise. All scripture is God breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. And then he ends the verse by saying that it is the scripture that thoroughly equips you for every good work. Don't let anything or anybody cause you to waver from the Holy Scriptures. They do equip you and they do make you wise. And then Paul comes to chapter 4 and says to Timothy that he's going to need to press on through the hard times that he will always need to keep sharing the gospel, that he wants him to fulfill the calling that God has put on his life. Paul says in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 6, For I am already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time for my departure has come. Paul says, At the end of the day, I fought the good fight. I finished the race, and I've kept the faith. The one thing that was consistent in all these ideas appears to be hardship. It was not easy to fight the good fight. There were times that he must have wanted to give up. This was not an easy race to finish. This was not a hundred meter sprint. This was a marathon of following God's, following God's ways of faithfulness. And so it says, I fi Paul says, I finished my race. Paul says he kept the faith. There were all kinds of pressure coming against him as he shared the gospel, but he kept the faith. He was persecuted. He was opposed. He battled. The reason Paul was able to keep the faith and fight the good fight and finish the faith is because he was able to see something far greater for his life. Paul was able to see into eternity. He was able to see and to imagine what is on the other side and believe in it. Paul said, I'm about to leave. My life has come to an end now, but I know there's something great on the horizon. In 2 Timothy 4 and verse 8, he says, Now, now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. Not just for Paul, but also for all of us. He says, not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. In those words, Paul reaches for you, and he reaches for me, and he pulls us into his story. This is for us who understand that we are guaranteed hardship in the world. 
but you know what I'm longing for, something more, and I'm longing for somebody more, and I know that at the end of this other life, whatever I have to go through, I know what is on the other side, and I know who is on the other side. Paul was confident that despite all the hardships and challenges, that God was good. How do we live in this difficult world and know that God is actually doing something glorious and that it's all for good? Let's see how Paul did this and how we can learn from him. For him, Christianity was, was very personal. In Acts chapter 9, we read of his story. He was persecuting the Christians, breathing murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. Those are the words recorded in Acts 9 verse 1. Paul hated Christians. And then he meets Jesus on the road to Damascus. Suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus. Jesus called Paul by name. His very first encounter with Jesus is personal. The Lord called him Saul, and this was his name before he became Paul. Philippians 3 verses 7 to 8 we read, but Whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus as my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ. How did Paul, in the journey of his hard life, know that God is good so he could make it to the end? Well, because he had a relationship with Jesus. He knew Jesus and Jesus knew him by name. They had a personal relationship. And as he pursued that relationship with Jesus, he began to discover layer by layer, by layer by layer, just how good God was. God was so, so, so good to Paul that he saved him. He forgave him. He empowered him to serve. Is it personal for you? Is your relationship with the Savior a personal one? Was there a moment in your life when you can remember that he called you by name? Life is hard. But God is good. And the only way you're going to know that and get the, the benefit of that is if you know that it is a personal relationship between you and Jesus. Paul had a, an, a grace awakening to the very nature of the gospel. When Saul was persecuting God, and the Lord called him out and said to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And starting from that moment, Paul had a grace awakening to God. His awakening to the grace of God was so strong and so powerful that Paul wrote to us in Romans 5 verses 9 and 10, how much more, how much more, since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if while we were sent God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through this life? Paul meets Jesus, and in that moment, he gets a crash course on God's grace. Earlier in the Bible, Paul had described himself as the least of the apostles. He doesn't even deserve to be called an apostle. And later on, he says, I'm, the, I'm less than the least of all God's people. And if he has not beaten himself up enough, he describes himself in Timothy as the worst of all sinners. However, the more he grew in his relationship with Jesus, the more he began to understand the depth of the grace of God, the more he began to understand the wonder of forgiveness. Those verses in Romans 5, as read above, speak to us on this day of his amazing grace. Jesus did it all so we can step into this amazing grace where we in our stand. Paul knew he was going to go through hardship. But he knew that every step of the way he would never lose confidence, but rather he would gain confidence, knowing that life is hard, but God is good. What else do we know about Paul's life? Well, he had a new calling on his life. Paul did not just get saved and get a ticket to heaven. Paul got a new calling on his life. Acts 9 verse 20 says that once he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. Paul was to play a key role in taking the gospel to the world. God is calling us to himself. And more than that, he is wanting to call you into his plan. And give you a purpose and give you an assignment to take his name to others. And he's calling and equipping us 
to take the gospel to the world. And now Paul has a calling on his life. And you know what that calling does for him? Well, he puts all earthly gain and pain at the bottom. Philippians 3 verse 7 to 8, Paul says, Everything that I had previously, I consider rubbish, I consider it garbage before I knew Christ. But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ, wrote Paul. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For whose sake I have lost all things, I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ. Paul says that all the stuff that I once had, the riches, the gains, the recognition, I consider it garbage. Compared to the gift of knowing Jesus, compared to the gift of a personal relationship with Jesus. While in prison... Ephesians 6 verses 19 to 20. Chained to prison guards. Paul doesn't ask for prayers to be set free. But he asks that the others would see the grace of God. He says, whenever I open my mouth, words may be given me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel. For which I am an ambassador in change, chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. He didn't ask to be set free. He simply asked that the others would know the grace of God that he had to experience and the wonder of forgiveness. Life was hard, but God is good. What may look to us like ordinary actions could be being used by God to write an extraordinary eternal story. When we let God work on our hearts, we see some wonderful changes within us, as hard as that might be. And hopefully we have done that or we are doing that. First, it was as if we are not going to make it through. Then maybe we thought we are going to make it through. Then in these moments of lockdown, we thought, well, maybe my marriage is not as strong as I thought it was. Maybe we've had moments where we thought my mental makeup is not as good as I thought it was. And in this pandemic, we started realizing that we need God more and more than ever. Your faithfulness in these months to say, I'm going to fight the good fight. I'm going to keep running my race, even right here in the hardships. I'm going to keep believing and I'm going to keep clinging to the faith, even in the hardship. You have no way of knowing how God is using that in his eternal story. Be reassured. He is good. And a good God always redeems the pain and the sorrow of our lives into his eternal story. Nothing goes to waste. He has an amazing way of doing that. He takes our many mistakes and he weaves them into the story of our lives by his grace for his good. Paul had no way of knowing the letter he was writing to young Timothy, writing from prison. And what may have looked insignificant to the world, he had no way of knowing what would become of that letter. He was just writing it to one person. But God knew he was in the hole of prison and nothing is ordinary in the economy of God. And God was saying in those moments, in the depth of the darkness of a prison cell, when life was hard, I will take this letter that you are writing, Paul, to your young son in the faith, and I'm going to encourage so many people, so many congregations around the world in their journey today. I'm going to encourage every follower of Jesus by what you are putting on this paper today. I'm going to remind them that through your many letters, and particularly this one, that though life is hard, God was saying, I'm going to show them that I am good. That is why Paul could write in 2 Corinthians 4 verses 16 to 17, Therefore we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away, Yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and moment, momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. That is why we look at the things that are unseen. Because they are eternal. And Paul believed that he had a good God even in hard times. A God who uses ordinary things in extraordinary ways in his eternal story. Life is hard, but God is good. Paul was convinced that he would see Jesus. He was convinced that at the end of his race of life, at the end of the fight, he was going to see Jesus face to face. He said, now there is in store for me something, that something was a crown of righteousness, 
I mean, it's amazing that he had his eyes on this crown. And we are encouraged this morning to run our race so that we too will receive a crown. There's something waiting for you and, and me at the end of the story. But more than that, more than anything else, there's someone waiting for us at the end of the story. The judge, the Lord, a righteous judge, set point. At the end of this life, there is a person and his name is Jesus. And we all want to hear the words that Paul heard, well done, good and faithful servants, when we meet Jesus face to face one day. Those very words we would love to hear. We all want to hear them. Well done, good and faithful servant. And when we see him face to face, he will say life was hard. But if you really want to understand hardship, he will show us his hands and he will say, do you see these scars? And he will remind us that God is good. It's been hard. It's not been easy this year. But I really believe we're going to see and we are seeing the goodness of God. And one day we will see. And on that day, he will blow our minds as to just how good he is. Because no eye has seen and no ear has heard and no mind knows what is in store for those who love him. It is 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 9. Again, words written by Paul who understood hardship. We cannot imagine all that God has in store for us in this life and for eternity. He's promised he will create a new heaven and a new earth. And we will live with him forever one day. And until then, the Holy Spirit, which is left behind, will fill our hearts and minds to guide us and comfort us. Knowing the wonderful and eternal future that awaits us, gives us hope and courage to press on in this life, to endure hardship. The world is not all there is, the best is yet to come. And so we say this morning, God, you're good on a whole new level, a other level, another level. We say this morning, God, you're beautiful beyond description. We remind ourselves this morning through the story of Paul's life and the readings that even though life is hard, God is good. And so do you know this good God this morning? Let us pray. We pray this morning for those who feel forgotten and unseen. May they know that they are remembered and seen by you, God. We pray for those we know who struggle with mental illness, anxiety, and depression. Help us to be a friend and a listening ear to those who suffer. Fill us with compassion and wisdom. We pray for those who wrestle with sorrow that they may know your victory over those dark thoughts which currently seem to triumph. We pray for those who have lost hope and purpose. Reignite a passion within them, restore their dreams. Remind us each day that you are good and in your name we can safely place our trust. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God our Father and the strength and fellowship of his Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you now and always. Amen.